hearty welcome to New England Authors with Camille Nasser. I'm so happy that you can be with us to share the life and the experiences and the expertise of the wonderful people that we have in this region. And one of the wonderful people is sitting right next to me here, Catherine Anderson. Welcome, Catherine. Thank Kate. You. Yes. Um, uh, you've written a lot of books about mental institutions. Uh, asylums. Uh, tell us, what got, uh, and you photographed them. Yes. So what got you interested in? Um, originally, my career got me interested. I worked in residential treatment facilities for children with mental illness. And around the time that I was working in my first residential, a friend of mine said, um, they're tearing down the Northampton State Hospital, and yeah. let's go take a look at it. Yes. So I went up, I walked around it a little bit. It was already fenced off. They were getting ready to demolish it. Um, and a couple of teenagers came up and asked if we were going in. Yeah. And at first I said no. And they said, well, that's too bad because we know where the tunnels are and we're going in. Uh -huh. And I don't think I thought twice. I, I followed them down into the tunnels and um, came up into the main asylum. And it was, um, it was an incredible experience. It was probably one of the most beautiful buildings I'd ever seen. And I went home and immediately started doing research. Uh, uh, about mental asylums. About the building itself. Uh, oh, that, about the building. That led to the yeah. asylums. <laughs> yeah, there were, there were uh, tremendous buildings, weren't there? They were yes. beautifully architectured and, yeah. and stuff like that. So um, I uh, discovered that in the 1950s, <laughs> at the height of institutionalization of mentally ill people, uh, the United States had 560,000 uh, people in mental institutions, mm -hmm. and uh, which, which had a population of about half what we have today. Um, and then what happened in 1972 to 1982 there was the deinstitutionalization mm -hmm. of people and all. Yes. Uh, you followed all this, right? I, you, yes. Tell us yeah. what, what happened. What's, what, what, were the, what were the psychological uh, factors that changed our... Well, in the 1960s, um, the deinstitutionalization movement was actually spearheaded by John F. Kennedy, whose oh, sister really? had been lobotomized uh -huh. and ended up institutionalized uh -huh. for the remainder of her life. Yes. Um, and he set about to close all of the asylums as part of the human rights movement, making sure the patients were um, being treated well and given all of their human rights. And his belief was the only way to do that was to close these institutions. Um, unfortunately, as great as that theory was on paper, it wasn't that great in practice because most communities were not ready for yes, this yes. influx of patients into their neighborhoods. Yeah. Um, there wasn't enough funding. Things just were not, the infrastructure wasn't there for these patients to go out on their own. Right. Um, and unfortunately, that contributed to a skyrocketing homeless population. Which we have today. Yes, right. we still battle it today. Um, currently, the top three treatment facilities for mental health are maximum security prisons, not hospitals, not outpatient clinics but prisons yeah and and maybe uh, halfway houses yeah that's yeah that's such a shame yeah mm -hmm. so um, and then why were these buildings so elaborate you you talk about we're gonna get to your books in a minute <laughs> I'm just so uh, interested to learn uh, about um, the the institutionalization of the mentally ill um, the reason that the buildings were as ornate as they were which you can see in the picture on the the Danvers yeah. book is they were all built on a particular floor plan designed by Thomas Story Kirkbride, who was a superintendent of a hospital in Pennsylvania yeah. and one of the founders of the American Psychiatric Association. And he believed that the beauty of the building was just as important as what was going on inside the building. Uh -huh. Most people who were deemed insane and committed to hospital had done so because there was something going wrong in their home life. Yeah. So Kirkbride strove to take these people away from what it was that ailed them and put them in a completely different atmosphere with um, you know, beautiful views of the perfectly manicured grounds, rolling yeah. hills, fresh air. Yes. Um, everyone had a private room. Most of these buildings, in, in many cases, were the first to have steam heat and indoor plumbing and gas lighting in the towns that they were built in. Yeah. And they were incredible um, examples of the architecture of their time. And they were made to be beautiful. Yes. Now, this uh, Denver, Denver's mm -hmm. is um, 
uh, your first book. These are uh, mental institutions in the New England. Uh, excuse me, your la your latest book. My latest Dan book, yes. Danvers is, and Danvers has got a tremendous uh, history. It started mm -hmm. in what was it, 1897? 1874. 1874. Yep. Right, and went on until um, until it closed for good in 1991. Is the then the building was still standing? Is still yes. standing now. Um, the building is now actually luxury apartments. Really? Yes, <laughs> yes. it is. And so 1874, um, things were different then. Uh, tell us, go through us, tell us what had changed during that century. Um, uh, around that time, we saw a great influx of immigration to the United States, which was a big part of the push towards more social services being available. Most of the time, when someone fell on hard luck or was struggling in, in their life, they ended up in an almshouse, a poor house, or working on a poor farm. Yeah. Um, and eventually, the almshouses discovered that their population of insane or people who they believed to be insane inside of those institutions had grown so great they couldn't handle it, so they began building separate asylums. And yeah. that's how places like Danvers and Worcester and Taunton and Northampton all came to be. Yeah. So do you know the history of uh, Bedlam? Can I do. Tell us. <laughs> um, so Bedlam is actually the Royal Bethlehem Hospital in the yeah. UK. Right. Um, and it was an institution that actually still survives today. But it was a place where you could actually pay to go and see the crazy people in their cages. And yes. you could get dressed up on a Sunday and go and taunt the patients and watch them go wild. And that's where the term pure bedlam comes from, to mean chaos and insanity. Yes. Um, but it was a massive, massive hospital that, um, again, still operates today. In, in London. In London. Yeah, yes. Um, and, uh, and bedlam, as you said, is a corruption of the word Bethlehem. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, and uh, people still paid to see the insane uh, mm. people, uh, and they must have known that they were like actors and then hammed it up a bit. Of course, yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah, until when? Um, until well, believe it or not, even Danvers State Hospital attracted thousands of people, tens of thousands of people each year that came as visitors, um, ostensibly to see the beautiful formal gardens that Danvers State Hospital had. But in many cases, it was to see what life was like in an institution. Um, but mo many people were very kind about it. They brought gifts for the patients. They brought flowers and books and magazines and things yeah. like that. Um, but it was also a great way for the hospitals to bring in money. Um, Bedlam or Bethlehem actually covered its operating expenses almost entirely through charging people to come and visit. Really? Um, yeah, and that, that's amazing. a trend that kind of remained, that people were yeah. more willing to donate after they had seen the place in person. Oh, I see, I see. Now, uh, your uh, book that you have here, Hospital yes. Hill, um, that's a uh, fictionalized it hospital, is. but it's taken from a real hospital, yes. right? Which one? Yes, it's actually Northampton State Hospital. That, no, the yeah. book itself is 100% historically accurate, except for the mystery. Yes. There, Everything in it is real, the town, the restaurants. Yeah, yeah I don't, I don't want to give away the mystery, but no. um, there's an interesting <laughs> doctor in there, yes. and he would be like a sexual predator, mm -hmm. uh, considered like, uh, talk a little about him. What, how did you get this? Well, um, he didn't start out like that. Um, in the initial incarnation of the book, um, my main character was very much in love with him. Um, and it was a, a mutual admiration society. But as the book grew, um, the doctor's character became a little more, um, more menacing, a little bit more um, out of control. And it suited the plot a little bit more for him to be um, not as nice as he was originally. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and then the, your protagonist mm -hmm. is a woman who worked in the hospital, yes. right? And mm -hmm. what happens to her? What? Um, well, Valerie starts on the wards in the 50s, um, and the book flashes back and forth between her time there in the 50s, um, so that people can get a really good look at what asylums were like in the 50s and 60s, and then flashes forward to when she's near retirement, and she comes back to the now abandoned hospital um, to take care of one last filing job. So. It, it follows her most of her career, and then Shadows in the Ward follows the rest of her career. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, just to get things straight, sure. she worked in the 1950s during the heyday, yes. and then she's asked to come back to take care of some, yes. uh, some records, yep. and then she finds out. What, what does she find out? Um, um, she finds out that, that this doctor that she had always assumed was not on the up and up was indeed not on the up and up, and there were things going on that she and the other nurses had no idea was happening when they were there. 
Um, but now it's coming to light as she goes through all of these files and she goes through all of her memories of what it was like on the ward and all these patients that she had contact with. Okay, all right. So uh, it has, a, it has a, a very interesting ending, very lively, uh, lively ending. Tell us about Shadows in the Ward. Um, Shadows in the Ward actually um, picks up in between times. So um, many of the Department of Mental Health employees ended up having to transfer from hospital to hospital as they closed. So in Hospital Hill, Valerie transfers from Northampton to Westboro. This picks up when she's at Westboro before she comes back to Northampton. A little convoluted, but um, it picks up in the middle and she is working at Westboro State Hospital as a clinical supervisor for a young woman who is becoming a psychiatric nurse. Right. right. Um, and it takes you through, again, the daily life on the wards at Westboro State Hospital, which was a very different hospital from Northampton. Yeah, what, year, what years did you say? So this is about the 90s, the early the, 90s. The early 90s. Mm -hmm. So um, my question is, uh, do we need these institutions today? Um, I hold the unpopular opinion that yes, we do. Um, but. The bigger question is how we do this over again. If we were to go into a cycle of reinstitutionalization on a grand scale is how we would do it. Um, and most of that comes from studying the countries that have been successful. The Scandinavian countries have been exceptionally successful with their mental health care. We have not. Um, our health care system all the way around, mental health and physical health, is a for-profit venture, which makes it very difficult for yes. us to yes. um, truly take the time to treat mental illness the way we need to. Mental illness is not something you can treat in a day, a week, a month. You can't treat it with a course of antibiotics. And it also manifests differently in every person. You can have six people in a room that all have the same diagnosis and they all present differently and they all have to be treated differently. And for that to happen, we have to, we have to truly figure out how to personalize care and the U.S. is not at that point right now. Right. I have a, f a friend who um, worked in the mental health department as an administrator, and uh, he said that apparently the, the state pays uh, 21 days of hospitalization, and then after that you need special... Uh, and it, it was remarkable to him how exactly at 21 days people were cured and, yeah. and <laughs> set free. Yes. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, when you say uh, uh, the mental health is for profit, is it the same system as the general health? Yes, it's the same system. It's the same hospital yep. system. It's all governed by health insurance. It's the same, the same general system and the same, um, the same general approach to how, how things are funded and how people are required to pay for care. Um, and that definitely dictates the quality and the length of care. Yeah, and so uh, I'm going to remember here Thomas Eagleton. Do you mm -hmm. remember him? He was uh, the running mate, the first running mate of uh, George McGovern in mm -hmm. 1972. Okay, before your time. Before my time, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, and when it came out that he was uh, so, uh, so he was selected by George McGovern mm -hmm. at the convention, the Democratic convention in 1972. I hope I have my history right. And, um, and it came out that he was treated for depression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was humiliated um, to drop out of all. He had to kind of drop out. Um, that attitude has changed now, right? Uh, Marginally. Um, it depends yeah. on where you live. Um, um, it depends on um, what job you hold. It depends on um, it depends on a lot of factors as to how how much of the stigma still remains. But it's still we still have a long way to go in eliminating the stigma that surrounds mental illness. Oh, what, what can we do? Um, from my point of view, the biggest thing that people can do is ask questions and not be afraid to have the frank and open discussions about mental illness. Um, over the course of my 12 years writing about institutions, I started out writing strictly nonfiction. I wrote histories of mental illness, and I noticed that um, I would get maybe 10 or 15 people that would show up. And most of the people that would show up were people who worked in the field. Oh, they were already talking yeah. about it every day. Yeah. And then I wrote a fiction novel about mental health. And I would get crowds of 150 people that would come and they would listen to me read and they'd listen to me talk. And they'd be willing to ask questions because it was in the guise of asking about the novel. Yes. And we would have very lively discussions about mental health. 
but it was that comfort of hiding behind, well, I'm actually asking you about the novel. I'm not actually asking about mental health. Um, and I think people need to lose that fear of having that conversation. Thankfully, I think some of the generations that, that we are raising now are very open about their mental health. And they will say, you know, I have anxiety or I have bipolar or I take medication. Um, but it's still met with a lot of, okay, I don't really need to hear that. Um, mm -hmm. I appreciate that you have that, but I don't really need to hear that. And I think that's just the openness is, is where we need yes, to head. Yes, yes. Okay, this is um, uh, New England Authors with Camille Nasser, and I'm, t I'm talking with Kate Anderson or Catherine Anderson. <laughs> um, why, don't you, why don't you put Kate on your, on your book uh, instead of Catherine? Because you like to be called Kate, Catherine, right? Catherine's mm -hmm. a little more professional, I guess. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, and um, uh, we want to ask you about uh, uh, where, where you're going next. Is it, you have another, are you going to oh. continue in the mental institutions? Yes. Um, I actually am starting another novel that fits into um, Hospital Hill and Shadows in the Ward. And I'm also in the process of writing a book about the state schools of New England, which were for folks with developmental disabilities. Um, but a little less lately, I own a publishing company, so a lot of my efforts go towards getting my other authors up and running. Oh, so oh, good. I don't what's, have as much what's time What's the name of the publishing it's company? It's called Dark Ink Press. Dark Ink. Oh, yes. that's great. And, and uh, is it fiction or you publish everything? We publish everything. Uh-huh. Oh, yep. uh, that's very good. So um, you're also a photographer, yes. and you're really interested in photograph uh, photographing the buildings. Mm -hmm. Do you display these photographs or um, what? I do. I do galleries occasionally. Um, there are some pretty beautiful galleries on my website of some of the places that I visited. Um, my book covers are my own original photographs as well um, and I do have a couple of books of my own photography out and about in the world. And, and does it, are they just about the architecture or are they something also about what, what went on in the institutions? Um, when I do a gallery it's just simply about the architecture and it just happens to be a collection generally of asylums and abandoned buildings um, but when I do the books it's I always try to include some history. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of history, isn't yes. there? Yes. Um, um, was this New England area? Were there more institutions in here than yes. there were? Yes. Um, yeah. The the number of institutions per capita in New England outstrips that across the United States. And why is that? Um, because we we're home to the earliest settlements in the United States, the the earliest European settlements. So we were the first area to have these um, great collections of people living in one place where the idea of mental illness was actually, people started to notice that there was mental illness that needed to be cared for. Yeah, back in the old days, they did a lot of um, electroshock yes. treatment. Yes. Um, and they still do, right? Uh, they do still do electroshock treatment. It has changed drastically since the early days. Um, the original electroshock therapies were so rudimentary that um, even the person giving the treatments would get a shock from the machine. So you mentioned how, how different the Scandinavian mental health is. Can you say a little bit more about that? What's, what do they do that's different? Um, their, their bureaucracy is completely different. So their, their approach to healthcare is a very socialist approach. Um, anyone who needs access to healthcare can get it. And their mental health care system is meant to provide as short-term care as possible, but it's very individualized. So when mm -hmm. a patient comes in, their program is created for them. It's not created based on how much their insurance will cover or um, whether or not there's a bed available. And um, they've also integrated other social services programs into their mental health treatment and um, their nursing homes even. Um, they tend to kind of overlap all of their treatment programs so that it's not a case of, oh, you're going to go into hospital and you're going to be there for, you know, three, four, five years. It's you're going to go in, there's all of these treatment plans that are available, and there's follow through. There's follow through aftercare as well, yeah. which we are not very good at here in the U.S. Yeah, there might also be stronger family ties. That is yeah, the other part that's of it. probably yes. uh, a, Their societal strong... structure is very different. Um, uh, would you say that uh, a lot of the homeless people um, can be cared for in a different way? Um, I would say yes, a good deal of them. Um, I think, especially in Northampton, that's the area that I'm most familiar with because that's where I'm from. Um, 
If you ask most of the people who are out on the streets in the town, they will tell you that they were a patient at Northampton at one time or another. Um, and most of these people are people that could not adjust to community health care because you have patients who are living with 24-hour care. Yes. They're being told to get up, brush their teeth, get dressed, take their medication, eat. Um, and then when the hospital closed and patients were sent out into community care, they didn't have that anymore. They had to rely on themselves. But if you've spent your entire life having someone else care for you, yeah. and you are someone who must take their medication, otherwise they can't function, right. you stop taking your medication, you stop getting up in the morning, and you yeah. stop brushing your teeth, and you stop getting dressed. And the next step is, is we're not going out and finding jobs, so we're not paying rent, which means you know we're getting evicted. And in many cases, you know the mentally ill are the ones that are ending up in prison because they're not taking medication, they're um, not working, yes. you know, and yes. um, it's, a, it's a vicious it's cycle. A, it's a vicious cycle that goes mm -hmm. around. Um, uh, right now, one of the best um, care for mentally ill is, is medication, is that right? Um, it depends. Uh, for many people, medication works and it works very well, um, but there is a vast population of mentally ill for whom medication does not work. And there's a lot of people who don't want to take medication yes. because it has some side effects, right? Um, I, I would say it has a lot of side effects. And yeah. most of the side effects of any kind of um, antipsychotic or um, psychotropic medication are, they're pretty nasty side effects. Massive weight gain, um, yeah. facial tics, drooling, speech issues, yes. and some of these can be really, they can be long-lasting side effects because we're still not 100% sure what the long-lasting side effects of most of these medications yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, So um, I just want to go back a little bit. I'm sure. sorry to have dwelled so no, much on, okay. on mental health because it's such, about an, it for weeks. such an, <laughs> an interesting issue, and I'm going to talk a little about, about your books. Um, you said earlier that, that people came because it's fiction. Mm -hmm. People wanted to listen to story, yes. right? Um, how, mu how much is that important to you that you tell stories rather than you tell facts? How much um, more effective? The facts are more important to me and I weave the facts in as much as I possibly can in the novels. I want to make sure that as you're reading this cozy mystery that you are also learning as much as you possibly can about these institutions and about the treatment. Oh, absolutely, um, yeah. Much like, I mean, one of my absolute favorite books is Shutter Island by Dennis Lehane, which is yes. incredibly well done. Um, and you're learning a lot about mental health as you're reading this, you know, mysterious horror stories, so a lot of people don't realize just how much they're absorbing as they're reading. Yeah, so uh, you did a, a tremendous amount of research, yes. right? Uh, yeah. About how long, how long does it take you to research one of these um, books? You know? I, so Hospital Hill was 12 years in the making, um, only because I was writing nonfiction at the time, so I was doing the research already, and then I tried to pull it together into fiction, and I had to learn how to weave fiction into this nonfiction that I was so passionate about. Um, Shadows in the Word took me about six months because by then I already had all the I information. See, yeah. I had my characters, I had my setting, I knew where I was headed. I just had to spend those six months crafting the plot. Uh, we're talking with um, uh, Catherine Anderson, Kate Anderson, and she's written three books come, and coming out with a, a, another book about mental institutions and so on. So uh, when you did all this research, what are some of the, some of the surprises you found? Oh, there were, there were so many. Um, I think that, like most people, I was most familiar with the horror film mystery story uh, version of the insane asylum, the snake pit, as it were. But in doing the research on these asylums, I discovered that that's a very, very abbreviated point in time. It's only about a 20 to 30 year span at which those state hospitals were a mess. But for hundreds of years, they existed, and they were wonderful places of transformational care where people were being released and going back home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I had um, uh, a cousin back in the 1950s who was treated with a electric shock, mm. and uh, I guess it was pretty brutal. Yes. So um, do you remember the film One Flew Over the yes. Cuckoo's Nest? How mm -hmm. real is that? Um, it's somewhat accurate, and it was actually filmed in a real state hospital. It's Oregon State Hospital, which is oh. now a museum, oh. um, but still partially an active maximum security mental health facility. Um, the lobotomy is not 100% accurate in that movie, um, but it's close. 
And I think that a lot of a lot of the more existential issues that Ken Casey touched on in that in that book and then was brought to life in the movie are are very real and very accurate. Yeah. Where where do we stand now? Uh, in terms of mental health, where are you you kind of said uh, we're not we're not no. there um, yet. <laughs> Um, we're not there in acceptance. Where does the... We're not there the, in treatment either. Uh, we don't have enough treatment facilities. We don't have enough beds. Um, we're still kind of muddling along trying to figure out the world of medication. We're still trying to figure out how best to um, create and use therapy with patients. And every day we discover more facets of mental illnesses that we were not aware of. Mm. Um, as we grow in our ability to diagnose and grow in our ability to treat, um, it kind of muddies the waters further. So yeah, yeah. It's so, difficult. Can I ask you one, one other question? Um, is autism on the rise? Um, <laughs> I, I, autism is a difficult one for me because I don't know a whole lot about it, um, especially in, the, in my career. I work specifically with kids with social-emotional disabilities, which is a whole other world from autism. Um, I think it's diagnosed more often now, um, but I also think it's misdiagnosed as often as it's correctly diagnosed. Yeah. Um, and that's another, just like mental illness, autism is a spectrum disorder, so it looks different in everyone that's diagnosed with it. So again, we're still kind of muddling through trying to figure out how best to treat and handle autism and everything that goes along with it. Well, um, we're just uh, winding now, winding to the to the end now. Uh, we're talking with uh, Kate Anderson, Catherine Anderson, who has some uh, delightful books. I really enjoyed reading, and uh, I haven't read the Danvers one. I'm looking forward to reading that because of the the, the long uh, century mm -hmm. history of the, of the mental hospital. I'm I'm really happy that you came and shared all thank your you your me. wonderful knowledge here. We could have gone on and on and oh, on. Yes. <laughs> and, Days. and thank you very much. Uh, thank thank you, you for being with. Uh, Doing the authors with Camille Nasser. Bye.